Guess Who Just Had a New Album Come Out Today. As of the day that this episode is going out, on Friday the 13th, there's a new album from the band The Delph Royers. The album is called 10,000 Ways to Die. Literally came out today, May 13th, 2022. I'm super excited. The Delph Royers is one of those bands that I discovered through putting together Monster Kid Radio over the years that I love. I love what they do. I really do. I'm a big fan of theirs. Uh, they probably have made their way into their, like my top five bands I've discovered here on Monster Kid Radio. I can't really, you know, put them in any order because I love them all. But check out this album. Check out the song you're listening to right now. It is called From the Deep. And of course, they gave us permission to play their music here on the show. But please check them out. Let them know that you appreciate them hooking us up here on Monster Kid Radio. Again, check out their Bandcamp page thedelstroyers.bandcamp.com and if you are in the Seattle area they've got a record release show coming up on May 28th at the Kraken Bar and Lounge I don't think I'm going to be able to make it but if you're in the Seattle area go check them out let them know that you heard about them here on Monster Kid Radio throw them some love throw them some support because they support us anyway Welcome to Monster Kid Radio. This is the podcast devoted to the classic and sometimes not so classic genre cinema of yesteryear. It's Monster Kid Radio, and I am your host, writer, producer, Derek M. Cook. And I'm thrilled to have you here because while we are already into May, you know we can't let a month like this go by without kicking off a little bit of luchador action. It's Lucha de Mayo here on Monster Kid Radio for the next three weeks. This week and the next two weeks, you're going to get... Luchador monster movie coverage. Monster-ish genre coverage. Yeah. Anyway, it's Luchador stuff. It's fun. It's one of the things that I live for on Monster Kid Radio. And over the next couple of weeks, I think you're going to hear me kind of go on a little bit of a journey regarding how I view the future of Luchador monster movies and Luchador movies in general here on Monster Kid Radio. So, if nothing else, listen for that. In the immediate future, though, listen to this week's episode because we've got Record All Monsters Robert Kelly on the show, and we're going to talk about a luchador movie not starring one, not starring two, but actually starring three luchadors, three for the price of one, the price being, well, your time this week on the show. The movie is called... Uh, <laughs> I cannot roll my R's. I really need to learn how to do that. So I'm going to give you the American title the English language title that it was given when it was released worldwide and up here in the States. Mystery in the Bermuda Triangle, also known as Mystery in the Bermuda, or Mystery in Bermuda, or Mystery in the Bermudas. Call it whatever you want. I'm going to call it a good time because we've got Blue Damon, El Santo, Mel Mascaris, running around doing some cool luchador stuff. There's an evil scientist in this movie. There's a karate princess in this movie. There's even some apocalyptic stuff in this movie. I kid you not. There are going to be spoilers. I think this month when we do Lucha de Mayo, more than any other type of movie that we cover here on the show, I really want to make sure that we give you spoiler warnings because a lot of these movies are not available through normal channels or uh, inexpensively or with subtitles or dubs or whatever up here in the States. And I know that most of the listeners on Monster Kid Radio are English speakers and readers, so it's sometimes difficult to get your hands on a copy of these movies that's easily accessible in terms of understanding what's going on on screen. Yes, you might understand the international language of Lucha, but it would be nice to have some of those, uh, you know, finer points available to us as well. In this movie, we did find a fan subtitled version of it. It's available online if you know where to look. I'm not going to put links to it because I don't know how on the up and up it is, but if you look for it, you will find it. Robert, Kelly, and I talk about it on the show this week, and it's a good one. Oh, man, it's so fun. It's got some great music and nothing else. It's got some great music, and I can tell you right now, I've already recorded next week's episode as well, and next week's episode has a movie that's got some incredibly cool, funky music in it as well. This may be... The Lucha de Mayo, where I celebrate the music more than in, <laughs> before. I know I talk about the music a lot here on the show, but this time, the music is just wonky, cool. I dig it, man. Ah! I dig this stuff so much. 
And I thank you for being here. Thank you for being here. Now, of course, it's not an episode of Monster Kid Radio if we don't have some of our regular segments. So we've got Mark Matsky's Beta Capsule Review coming up where he takes a look at every single episode of every single Ultraman show. We are in the middle of Ultra 7. 7. 7. 7. Right now, I know I swear I'm never going to do that again. And I'm not going to make that promise anymore because I'm going to break it. But Mark Matz, he's got an episode of Ultra 7 on deck. And Kenny has a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland, Mexican monster movie style. So that's going to be a good time as well. We've got all of that coming up. And hey, you know, I want to go back to Mark Matsky real quick just to kind of shine a little bit of a light on some things that he's got going on right now. Make sure you check out the Small Town Monsters YouTube channel. There's some new stuff that's gone up over there. Just within the past 24 hours, a documentary went up over at the Small Town Monsters YouTube channel, Bridgewater Triangle Bigfoot. Go check that out. I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. Like I said, it went up within the last 24 hours, but I mean, Small Town Monsters and anything that Mark Matsky's involved with, anything that he attaches himself to, you know it's going to be quality. And, you know, that was out of my mouth before I realized I just basically said that Monster Kid Radio's quality because, you know, of course it is. He wouldn't be involved. You know what? Let's finish enjoying the music. Let's get to the Beta Capsule Review to Kenny and everything else right after this. We must leave the rest of this sequence to your imagination. It is too diabolical for you to take. Black Pit of Dr. M. We must apologize. The shocks you are missing would make your blood run cold. Not since the cabinet of Dr. Caligari has the screen been so filled with the eerie. The shocking. The incredible. The diabolical. We warn you. See it only if you can take sudden shocks. Shattering terror. Black Pit of Dr. M. I am Dr. Lee Cushing. Welcome to my Chamber of Horrors. Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors is a monster rally novel in the tradition of the classic Universal and Hammer horror film. It's written by Stephen D. Sullivan, the award-winning author of White Zombie, Daikaiju Attack, Manos the Hands of Fate, and one of the creators of the original chill role-playing game. This book recreates the thrills of the classic monster vs. monster film. We've got vampires, werewolves, mummies, psychic twins, scheming madmen, and plenty of unexpected chills. Now you can get Dr. Cushing's Chamber of Horrors in print or for Kindle at Amazon.com and other fine retailers. Coming soon in other ebook formats. Find out more at CushingHorrors.com or SDSullivan.com and support Steve's work through Patreon at PaySteve.com. I do hope you've enjoyed your visit. Please come again. And remember, the chamber is always waiting for its next victim. Live from the Land of Light in Nebula M78, home of the mighty Ultra Heroes, it's Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review. A young miner who's a dead ringer for Dan Moriboshi is trapped underground in Ultra 7 Episode 17, deep in the earth, go, go, go. The miner, whose name is Jiro, earned the nickname Miracle Man for surviving a nasty fall, and when the Ultra Guard becomes involved in the rescue, Dan seems to sense something familiar in the story. Using his Ultra 7 vision, he sees Jiro's face, and in a flashback, it's revealed that Ultra 7 has indeed met him before. He saved Jiro when the young man sacrificed his life for a friend in a climbing accident. Moved by Jiro's bravery, Ultra 7 patterned his human form on the courageous young man, becoming his doppelganger. Therefore, Dan resolves to save Jiro no matter the cost. 
Captain Kiriyama approves the use of the awesome Magma Riser, a drill bit tank that cuts through rock with ease. However, at the same time the air vent to Jiro becomes blocked, the Magma Riser runs into a mysterious obstacle, which Dan uses bombs to remove. The explosion penetrates the wall of a secret base, and when Dan goes missing, Soga, Amagi, and Anne find themselves in a shootout with hostile robots. Robots who have restrained Dan and separated him from his Ultra Eye. Survival looks less and less likely for Jiro unless the miner has one more miracle up his sleeve. Deep in the Earth, Go 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 is perfectly titled capturing both the subterranean setting and the propulsive storyline with accuracy. Once again, parallels with other series abound, recalling that the first episode of Ultra Q featured miners and caves, and one of Ultraman's scarier adventures was driven by a murderous mummy, unearthed from its tomb. It's a bit surprising that there's no giant monster to fight, and the conclusion that the underground base is preparing for an invasion is a presumption, adding an ambiguity the show tends to embrace. The highlight for fans, of course, is the origin story of the man named Dan, and the insight we gain into Ultra 7's deep respect for the human beings of planet Earth. For Monster Kid Radio's Beta Capsule Review, this is Mark Matsky reporting. of Babylon I've walked the earth, challenging the most venturesome of men. I am this sinuous creature, a killer cat, and I'm a woman, seductive, tantalizing, inviting a lover's caress. But to caress me is to play with death. I am the mystery woman of the ages, feline, fascinating. To know me is to know all my loves, all the lives I've lived, the deaths I've caused. I am the essence in woman that no man can resist. I am Cat Girl. a shaft of light coming up out of the ocean. It was being guarded by a, a sea creature. I believe this light killed three men. Into uncharted secret coves hidden beneath the sea's surface go the daredevil hunters of the deep, searching out the mystery of sudden death. The secrets of the phantom from 10,000 leagues. Starring Kent Taylor, lovely Kathy Downs, and Michael Whalen, all enmeshed in a scientific web of terror involving secret death rays that unidentified nations will stop at nothing to obtain. Almost like it was burned by an atomic flash. Fisherman, too. Man bait, a luscious blonde too tantalizing for the weak to resist. I didn't know then they could put beauty and poison so cleverly together in one package. <laughs> but the shadow of the phantom death does not stop daring underwater adventures while a man of science probes the unknown for the answer to the phantom from 10,000 leagues. Don't miss the phantom from 10,000 leagues. Hello there, Monster Kid Radio Hits. This is Kenny with a look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. For this year's Lucha de Mayo, 
We are going to look at a two-part article published in July and December of 1964 in issues 29 and 31. Mexic Creatures gave an overview of South of the Border monster movies up to that time. Both parts were loaded with photos to whet your appetite for these obscure classics. If you think we'll ever run out of Mexican monster movies to watch, you will learn in the next three weeks it will take a long time for Derek to cover them all. Let's get started. For some time now, scores of vampires, robots, witches, mummies and many other horrors have, in our neighboring country to the south, been out to even the score with us North Americans. However, only the most hep of horror fans have been aware of this invasion, and in this article I intend to tell all, at least all I know, about Mexican fright and fantasy films. Unfortunately for those far gone monster followers who would like to see every creature picture, regardless of whether it's in English, Spanish, Germish or Transylvanish, most Mexican movies are shown in the USA only for Spanish-speaking audiences. Few are dubbed into English, like the Japanese monster movies, or even given English subtitles. Yet many are made and played in Mexico. Occasionally, Mexi movies are given a more general release. For example, Mysteries of the Inner Tomb, Misterios de la Ultratumba, was dubbed into English and played around the country under the title Black Pit of Dr. M. Somewhat in theme like Karloff's The Devil Commands. It concerns an attempt to learn the secret of what lies beyond the grave. Another example is, Macario, a classic fantasy in which the devil, God, and death, all take part in the picture as human beings. Adam and Eva. Adam and Eve was also given general release in the United States, so that it was possible for some fantasy film fans to view the mythical happenings when the world began and the devil took the form of a serpent in the Garden of Eden. The last place you would probably look for the fantastic in a film would be in a picture bearing the pleasant title of Santa Claus, but it features a demon and a lot of fantastic gadgetry and is regularly re-released every Christmas. Visually the Mexican horror films show quite a bit of imagination. The monsters are quite as ghastly as those produced anywhere else in the world, and the settings seem to have more atmosphere and character than most low-budget beast picks made in the United States. Another thing to consider is that with this type of film, not being able to understand the dialogue is not necessarily a disadvantage, it leaves a lot to your own imagination. That is all for this week's look at Famous Monsters of Filmland. We will have more next week. For MKR, this is Kenny saying adios. shattering emotional experience that takes its place with the screen's most distinguished classics, that dares explore uncharted realms of exciting wizardry, that will ignite a storm of controversy with its strength and candor. How old were you when you first let a man make love to you? Next, who was he? Next, how did you feel at the time? Next, how did you feel afterward? What did you feel? What did you think? Were you pleased, frightened, ecstatic, disgusted? What did he say? What words did you speak? That's what I want to know. Now, tell me. Now, now, all of it. Robert Block, author of Psycho, creates a new masterpiece of suspense. The Cabinet of Caligari. Starring Glynis Johns, a girl alone in a house of terror. And Dan O'Hurley as Caligari. Spying, peeping, it's cowardly, vicious. I was completely vulnerable in my bath. My bath, my house, my sphere. And you are my guest. Guest? We both know I'm a prisoner behind locked gates. Psycho had it. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde had it. Rebecca had it. And now the cabinet of Caligari brings a new, shocking impact to the screen. What are you thinking now? Tell me, now. What are you feeling? Tell me, now, now. Look at me. What does it feel like not to have any feeling? Go ahead, look at me. I wish the whole house were here, all of them. 
not to see me, to see you. You may loathe him, acclaim him, accept him, reject him. But you'll talk about Caligari for months to come. This may be what we've been listening for for the past four years. At last, contact with another planet, but it's really contact with nightmare. Nick. From out of this world, from out of the vast, frightening unknown, come the Terranauts. Something came out of the sky, picked the building up bodily and, and tore it out of the ground. One moment on solid from your Earth, the next kidnapped into an, an enemy world. will be destroyed or driven into caves like savages unless we can do unless we stop this enemy first we must wait till we're within range you'll thrill to the most fantastic intergalactic battle ever a warring asteroid challenged by a handful of humans a million miles out in space determined to save the Earth from the Terranauts. This is Count Dracula, and I'm here to offer you a friendly warning. Derek and his guests often get excited, and occasionally this results in revealing key plot points of the movies they're discussing. You know how the children of the night, ah, I mean monster kids, can get sometimes. So consider yourself warned, and don't come begging to me to kill them for their transgressions afterward. I have more pressing issues to take care of, like that pesky Van Helsing. Well, listeners, we might be a week into May already, but I am not going to let another month like this go by without talking about some luchador monster movies, science fiction genre, fun stuff, and I'm going to do it with some friends. I am kicking off Lucha de Mayo 2022 with Record All Monsters, Robert L. Kelly. Rob, how's it going, man? Is is buen, bien, muy bien, uh, gracias for, no, thank you for having me here. Uh, <laughs> wow, that happened. <laughs> <laughs> on uh, on Monster Kid Radio for Lucha de Mayo. I am right. so excited. This is actually how I found your show. Yeah? Yeah, I'm a, a, an El Santo hound. Yeah. And I was just looking at, through podcasts, various podcast apps for stuff about El Santo. And one of your, uh, I, I forget which episode it was, uh, but one of your episodes from a previous Lucha de Mayo came up. And I just blazed, first I blazed through the Lucha de Mayo episodes. And then I just mm -hmm. started listening and uh, I'm I haven't turned back. Well, I'm happy to have you then, man, because this, this is fun for me. I love these Luchador monster movies. I, I stumbled across them. Um, I don't know if I've ever really talked about the origin of, of me and my fandom of these things. I mean, I love professional wrestling, so, mm -hmm. you know, that's there's always going to be that. But I think I first became really aware of the depth of these movies back when I was doing my Mail Order Zombie podcast. And Keith Rainville put out a book. I forget what it was called, but the word zombie was in the title but it was mostly about the mummy films uh, of which there are many mm -hmm. luchador mummy films. I mean, mummies are kind of 
the thing, the the, the folk monster uh, for a lot of uh, Mexico. Yeah. And, you know, just if you are to believe the movies, Guanajuato is just riddled with them. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all up and about doing stuff. Um, and I, I started reading that book and just really did a deep dive. Keith Rainville uh, put out the From Parts Unknown zine. And I don't know if he's still active with this blog, but he used to do a blog uh, just featuring this kind of stuff as well. And he really knew his stuff. And then I started learning more and more and more. And, you know, Rob Cotter's book and just watching as many as I possibly can. Uh, don't speak Spanish. Uh, I don't understand most of it. I am incapable of rolling my R's. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you know, even if these movies don't have a subtitle or a, a dub, I still love them. I still love them. And uh, I am very happy to be able to shine a spotlight on them here on Monster Kid Radio. Even if they don't have the traditional monster, there is some ooh, kind of stuff happening in this one. No, they don't fight a Fu Manchu wearing Frankenstein no. or, you know, a, a, a weird looking emaciated Dracula or a wolfman that kills a kid for some reason or other. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> you know, we still have some action, some adventure. There's a lost mythical city there's a mystery about the bermudas going on it's just awesome it's, i had a blast with this um yeah it's so much fun i want to hear about your background with it i want so to hear about my your background, background I, I i'm from south texas um uh and my family my great-grandmother who was alive for a good portion of my life she lived to be 103 she wow loved wrestling um nice. she loved wrestling and we couldn't get like lucha mat uh, matches on tv where we were we were too far away for that especially after things went digital um sometimes okay sometimes at night over the old over the air antenna stuff we could get like very grainy matches for like a round or two but not much. Um, so I just kind of grew up with that around. And then the the movies were on TV a lot. And even the U.S. channels that were in Spanish. Mm -hmm. So I just always kind of knew about uh, Blue Demon and uh, El Santo. Uh, and my dad was very into wrestling during the 90s. So I had a little bit of Mil Masqueras because he came up. Nice. And was around, you mm -hmm. know, during the WCW. Um, so it was just always around for me. And when I got, when I was in high school, I very nearly started doing Lucha myself. Um, really? Yeah, there was a circuit in San Antonio, which isn't too far from where I live. Um, I think it's. Okay. I think there still is, and they had uh, open tryouts. I was like, "Wow!" I was seventeen. I had done some boxing. Um, I went to the open tryouts. I'm six foot four, like two hundred and seventy five, eighty pounds. You know, I w I was like, I can. I'm gonna have to do any work. And then when I got there, saw like <laughs> the pure athleticism of these people. I was like, "It's crazy, no, right?" I can't, I can't keep up with them. I can't. I'm gonna look like an idiot. And on top of that, I have a bad knee. So like, <laughs> oh yeah, no, this, nope, 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 nope. But uh, you know, I stayed and watched a bunch of the guys. It was great. So yeah, I love. I love, and the audience can't can't see this, but hold on, you can you can fill the dead air if you want. I'll fill it with some of that amazing music from this one. Uh oh, I was gonna say if you don't come back into camera wearing a luchador mask, fantastic, fantastic. Yes, uh, I have, 
I have a Santo mask. I have a Blue Demon mask. I have a, a Nacho Libre mask. Uh, well, <laughs> I have a Strong Dad mask. Uh, so. Oh wow! There's a deep cut. Nice. So uh, yeah, I. It's it's real for me, and I love it. And I'm gonna take this off because I can't really hear you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> No, I, I love this um, stuff. I have some luchador masks uh, in the other room, and I don't. I think they're just kind of generic. They're not based on anybody or whatever. Although I do have uh, a mask for wearing for COVID nineteen, uh, a Hurricane Ramirez design. So <laughs> it's like there you go, <laughs> there you go. The, uh, yeah, and I, I got this actually at uh, El Mercado in San Antonio, which is just a big downtown market. Nice. And they have booths and booths of luchador masks. One of them I went to, he wouldn't sell me a mask if I couldn't name the wrestler it belonged to. Oh, wow. Yeah. How'd you do? Did you pull it off? I got the ones I wanted. There you go. But Yeah, and I mean, this, this I love this stuff so much, Derek. There's a restaurant, it's closed down, unfortunately, called El Luchador that was a, ta a taco place here in town. And I went and I had a, a desayuno con el santo. Uh, I, I went and I, I had breakfast there on my birthday last year. And they had a big nice. portrait of El Santo and I sat down under it and I just had, you know, chorizo and eggs and it was just beautiful. Ah, oh, jealous. Jealous, dude. I live in the Pacific Northwest, which is pretty far away from anything Mexico. <laughs> uh, <laughs> go figure. Uh, but, you know, we do every once in a while, like for Cinco de Mayo, there's a couple of places that'll do like a luchador, um, a lucha event. They'll bring some people in. Um, there is a, there was at least one point, a school, uh, run by, I forget the luchador's name, mega boy, mm -hmm. mega boy. I don't remember for sure. I'd have to check. Uh, that's not too far away. And he did do, uh, like a brief appearance at a Santo film that was being shown at the Hollywood theater several years ago. Um, he and somebody else were there and, uh, they actually did some moves on each other on basically on stage at the Hollywood, which is great. Um, <laughs> and, uh, just, I'm such a fan of this stuff. Uh, you know, like some huge professional wrestling fan mm -hmm. anyway, but my favorite promotions when it comes to pro wrestling incorporate all the luchador stuff. Um, I miss Lucha underground, something fierce. Uh, I love Lucha underground. I get a little bit of that with what's happening on MLW right now. Cause I've got the Azteca underground stuff, <laughs> you know, AEW has got the luchadors. You know, anytime you give me some good luchador stuff, I'm all in. Um, no pun intended, since I just mentioned AEW and all in. <laughs> um, uh, um, you know, I know Triple Mania just happened, and I, I need to watch it. I need to get my hands on it. I'd like to see some of that stuff. Um, but, yeah, I just love it. And I love the theatricality of wrestling in general. And you add the luchador mix, and it's, it's superheroes. It's just this alternate reality that I would love to be part of these, these wrestlers walk around with their masks and their suits and their mock turtlenecks. <laughs> they come and go as they please, because they're all friends with the cops. Heck the cops work with, want them to work with them. You know, they're the cops. They're are just calling wrestlers. Them. That's <laughs> they're calling yeah. them in. They're like, Santo, I have a problem. Can you help me solve this mystery? It's like, I don't think I can. Yeah. If I get my friend blue demon on this, you know, it's like... <laughs> yeah. It's it's just this weird kind of reality. And I know, at least based on my research, you know, this is, I'm some gringo up here in the Pacific Northwest. So what do I really know? But based on what I've read and, and researched and seen in various documentaries, I mean, this is a thing. <laughs> this is not just somebody puts on a mask for wrestling. There, there are still luchadors working today in professional wrestling promotions whose names we don't yeah. know other than what they tell us their names are in the ring. Yeah. That's part of it. That's part of the culture, part of the identity. Um, when, um, oh, what was his name? I forget his name, but there was a particular wrestler who did a, a, a mask versus mask match. And that, that's a real deal. Yeah. I mean, you lose your mask, you lose your identity. Yeah. You know, unless your name's Ray Mysterio, you're done. Yeah. You know, and it, it's, it's just a, a culture that I am fascinated by. Uh, that I really respect. So to be able to talk about them and present them on Monster Kid Radio, just by looking at these movies that 
yeah, maybe they're considered cheesy or whatever I, by some. I love them. I have a blast with them. And when you mentioned loving this movie and having a background with this movie a while back, I thought, okay, we got to have you on the show. We're going to talk about it on Monster Kid Radio. And it's one that I've not seen. Now, I own about 60, 70 <laughs> Luchador movies. I've not watched all of them. I have this one. I've never watched it. And when you mentioned it, it's like, okay, I'm going to wait until we're going to talk about it on the shows because I'm going to watch it. I watched it this morning before work, which really set a weird tone for my work day. Uh, <laughs> but I watched it before work this morning. I loved it. This was, it's weird. It kind of is all over the place. <laughs> and it does some things that you don't normally see in these movies. Like how you end with like, by saying the book of Revelations is happening, then showing Adam Cloud. <laughs> I, I don't, how? How does that, that's not what you do in luchador movies. I don't, I don't get it, but okay. <laughs> but the important thing, Huge spoiler. I just fast forwarded to the yeah, end there. The important thing though, is that we can assume that, uh, Santo, Blue Demon, Nomascaris, and the Princess of Karate, uh, were taken to that undersea kingdom <laughs> and are safe from the atom bomb. I hope so, although they did pull up that mask when the kid was fishing. See, I, I I have always interpreted that as Santo renounced uh, uh, his earth, his, his surface life. Oh, okay. His surface life. I see. Um, to be with uh, Rina. I think that was her name. Okay. You know, I know I just went on, and we're talking about the mask, and I know I just went on a little mini rant about how the masks are important. My mask, Chris can't keep his mask on. I was thinking that. It's like, dude, it's like you're the man of a thousand masks. You've got plenty of masks. You don't need to be, you know. And and I've seen this happen before in other movies where you don't see his face. It's usually when he's with a woman, mm -hmm. and the woman is taking the mask off, or he's taking the mask off, and you always see the camera from the back of his head, or whatever, yeah. or see the back of his head. You know what I mean? It's like, dude, what what are you what are you doing? That's not. It's, it's uh, like Batman, okay. you know, like all, right. all Batman's girlfriends know who he is and he's dated like half of Gotham and three quarters right. of them of that population he's dated are supervillains. So it's like, right. Uh, although Mil to be fair, Mil Mascaris is usually presented, especially when you put the three of them together, he's usually presented as the one that's, well, I mean, he's younger than the other two. Yeah. He's the only one who's still around. Uh, but he's usually presented as kind of a, oh, darn, we're not going to go on vacation, or, oh, they've got an all-you-can-eat buffet. Yeah, yeah. You know, this kind the of fun-loving. Almost shaggy. Yeah, the fun-loving, shaggy-like yeah. kind of character. So maybe if one's going to take his mask off because he's with a beautiful woman, it's going to be yeah. him. Well, like, um, <laughs> in this movie. But dude. In this movie, when they're fighting the, uh, the last henchmen, Mm -hmm. Which is a great fun fight, by the way. It's they're all separated. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Mills fighting his guy, Santos fighting his guy, which their clothes all mirror each other too. I thought that was a neat touch. Yeah. Yeah. And uh Blue Demon's fighting his guy. Mill finishes his fight first because a grenade gets thrown and he just throws it back. <laughs> <laughs> And then his fight's over. And so we go to Santo yeah. and Blue Demon fighting. And when they go looking for him, they're like, is he okay? We heard an explosion. He's sitting eating bananas. <laughs> He's sitting there eating bananas. And they're like, what are you doing? And he's like, do you want a banana? <laughs> uh, I feel like Mill... If you look at like the entire filmography, is the one who matures the most as the, as the films continue, because he starts as his "Hey, you want a banana?" kind of guy in movies like this, or he takes his mask off because there's a beautiful woman nearby. Eventually, he's leading the Champions of Justice. So you know, at some point, he he does kind of grow up. I guess I don't know, mature. Uh, I don't know what the word is, well, I mean, but uh, yeah, I found. Yeah. He's an elder statesman of Lucha Libre by the end of his, his film career. And he's yeah. the new guy at this point. I love him. He's my Of the three, he's my favorite. And I think I've made that comment on the show before. I like Santo, I like Blue Demon, but Mil Mascaris is my dude. Santo is my guy. 
His movies were the ones I saw first on TV. That's how I came across this movie. It was on TV one day when I was like maybe 10 or 11. Okay. I don't speak very good Spanish. I understand it pretty well. And uh, so I was able to follow along. There's also large portions of this movie that are completely free of dialogue. Kind of a good entry point for uh, an 11 year old with minimal Spanish literacy. That makes sense. But I just loved it. And I always called, I know they give her a name. I know they give the country she's from a name. I've just always called her the princess of karate. Uh, I loved her. Uh, what's what the Arania? Like, is that where they're from? The, the princess of Arania. Yeah. yeah. Which. Okay. Um, but yeah. And I, I love when you see that, uh, you, you see in a few other movies too, where like Santos fighting some, ninjas or uh there's a blue demon movie which i really want to talk about in the future where he's finding the chinese mafia so there's like some karate stuff happening there i like seeing that mix and seeing lucha lucha come out on top because <laughs> it's lucha man yeah. it's the sport of kings well, come on well, and then this you know? this uh movie puts in that santo actually trained her in karate yes and her <laughs> And her mother and brother, who we'd never see. Right. But it's... This is one of my favorites. Just It was also filmed uh, down around where my family is from, in South Padre Island and McAllen and Edinburgh. Oh, okay. That's down cool. in South Texas. So, uh, And, like, especially the scenes on the beach, I'm like, I think I driven by there <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm pretty <laughs> sure <laughs> I just love the, the futuristic uh, Atlantean-esque city is a guy in a lawn chair <laughs> like in Bermuda shorts yelling at people in silver jumpsuits <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I love it so, uh, so this movie, it's really kind of a mess. Um, it, it really does kind of jump all over the place. It's, it's not like the greatest hits of Luchador monster movie stuff, but it really does feel like the greatest hits of everything else. Luchador yeah. <laughs> when it comes to these movies, uh, there is some secret agent spy stuff. The Luchadors are brought in to work with the government because there's some world threatening thing happening or may not happen and depending on who signs the treaty. It's just the government, by the way. Like it's just yeah, the it, yeah exactly. We're here on behalf of the government, and out of the blue, there's an Atlantean city. <laughs> okay, and yeah, there's lots of thunderstorms, and I guess there's a nuclear bomb that's going to go off at some point. Well, what? it's in the Book it's of happening. Revelations, uh, uh, you know? <laughs> like, uh, I, oh, God. Now I want to see, like, an illustration of the Four Horsemen as luchadors. That's oh, what I want God. to see. <laughs> well, you know, with the name like that, Blue Demon's going to have to be at the head of it. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I'm okay with that. One, one of my favorite things about this movie is that even though they're all traveling together, Mm -hmm. And they're going to the same places a lot of the times. They have each brought their trademark cars, and they drive them on the drone. So there's multiple scenes, like maybe two or three car chases, where you have all the bad guys in one car, and uh -huh. Santo in his, uh, what, what does he drive, a, a Mustang? I am not a car person, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. I mean, he drives a Mustang, a blue Mustang, blue demon in his red Corvette, and no Mosquitos in his gold Mercedes, which he makes sure that his mask matches the Mercedes when it's uh, when he's driving. <laughs> uh, I, I love this so much. Like, aside from the fond memories tied up in it. Mm -hmm. It does the other side of Lucha movies great. 
it, it represents them so well, I should say. Because you have the weird, wacky science, you have the espionage, yeah. you have... Uh, unusually, this movie uh, is all told in flashback. Which was a weird choice. I don't... like. I don't feel like the story benefited from being told in flashback. It didn't need to be done unless they needed to ex- come up with something to add to the film to make it long enough to run on TV. I don't I don't know. It just felt really unneeded. But yeah, the whole thing is this weird flashback between this guy and uh, this kid <laughs> who are fishing and he he pulls up the mask and well let me tell you why that ma- why that mask is important. Let me tell you what really happened and then there's the story. I think I think part of it is uh I I think from what I've been able to tell there were some rumors that Santo may have been retiring soon which okay. I think he retired from movies a year or two later cuz this came out in 1978 uh or not no 79 Okay. okay. So he retired shortly after that, and I think there were rumors that he was thinking about retiring. So to start the movie with someone pulling his mask out of a, you know, out of the ocean, and you're like, oh dang, are they killing Santo off in this movie? Right. It's like uh, the fake out of uh, uh, Wrath of Khan, like at the very beginning that they. uh, Oh, now I want to see Starfleet as sluge doors. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. But no, you're right. Yeah, it's it's that fake out. That kind of oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I didn't know that that there were rumors about Santo getting out of the biz at that point. Yeah. Um, which again, it's hard to trace a lot of this, especially with my my limited uh, literacy in Spanish. But like, I, I use a couple of newspaper archive sources through through my job mm-hmm. and occasionally I'll just put in the dates like like February 1980 uh, El Santo Lucha Libre and just see what I can find um, and now I want to work in a library because that would <laughs> I'd never get anything oh, done oh Derek I'll be just looking up weird stuff dude. I, have to, I have to reward myself with that sort of stuff I have to be like Okay, you have to make sure that this shelf on the bookmobile is full of the appropriate kind of books. But after you do that, you can go <laughs> and into the newspaper archives and look up drive-in advertisements for Godzilla movies. Okay? Okay. <laughs> do your job nice. for a little bit and you get five minutes of goofing off. <laughs> I love it. That's great. This this movie is just so so much fun for me. The nostalgia, the fact that it still sums up a bunch of the stuff I love about uh short movies besides the monsters. Mm-hmm. Which are always fun. The monsters are always fun. But Oh yeah. The... <laughs> I I also love the dynamic specifically of Santo, Blue Demon, and Mosqueras, because they all have clear roles, and they're consistent. Like even in their other pairings, like movie, like in the first uh, Champions of Justice movie, Santo or not Santo, uh, Blue Demon and Mosqueras have a similar dynamic to what they have in this movie. And mm-hmm. you watch the the Santo and Blue Demon movies. Santo takes the lead, you know, but, you know, Blue Demon's there, and he's, like, almost, uh, he's, like, support, and then Santo will be, like, this is something you should take the lead on, and, like, they, their dynamic is consistent, uh, more or less, across most of these movies. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I really like that, seeing that here. Because I think this is the only one I have seen. I, I haven't seen as many as I like. I would like. Um, I think this is the only one I've seen with these three, with the big three. I know they did at least one other together, but uh, there's one where it's it's billed as basically the three of them fighting monsters, but 
it's really Mascaris and Blue Demon, and then Santo shows up at the end with like a smoke gun. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah. Um, Santo ex machina. And he, uh... Right. <laughs> I like that. Uh, I went to the Internet Movie Cars database, by the way, while we were talking. Uh, this movie is listed there. So every car you want to know about in this movie is in, is listed here. Um, doesn't really say whose is whose other than this car gets driven by the lead character a lot. Uh -huh. um, but, yeah, you've got, you know, Ford Fairlanes. you got a Stingray in there. Uh, you got a Barracuda at one point. I mean, there's some cool <laughs> cars very cool here, cars. Everything I'll put a link to this in the show. Everything notes. in this movie is cool. That's yes, everything's cool. The wrestlers are cool. The Agreed. wrestling. So, a lot of people who watch these movies have a hard time getting through the wrestling scenes. I don't. I and, and I've said this before, I'm going to defend them too. I've said this on the show before as well. A lot of times. These wrestling scenes are the only place these scenes still exist. A lot of times they were they were pulled from existing matches, repurposed for the film. It's the only way we have them now. They weren't all being filmed and videotaped and saved the way, say, like the WWE does now with yeah. everything they do. You know, so a lot of times the only place to see some matches is in a movie. I like this one, though, because you can tell some of it was shot specifically for the right. film. The camera gets in the ring, which you don't normally see in these. Right. And I, I think it's a good cinematic wrestling match. And yes. it's a it's a it's a three on three. Uh yeah, you get all three of them together. It's great. It's a trios match. Yeah, it's so good. And the way, again, the way they play play with each other, like Blue Blue Demon goes in first. He's he's gonna start. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, Santos like on the side and forcing, making sure that the, the other team isn't, you know, getting in early or whatever, like it's, it's just, and then all hell breaks loose and they're just like brawling <laughs> in the, on the aisles of the stadium and like, and they, they win a decisive, decisive victory. Um, and it's, it's so much fun. It, it really is a treat. I I have also spoken with people who, while they like these movies, they feel like it gets bogged down when you do the wrestling stuff. Um, and I get that. You know, sometimes it's not handled very well. It's, it's clunky and obviously just kind of inserted to fill time. Yeah. Or to give an audience that wouldn't normally give an, have an opportunity to see this live, to see it on a screen somewhere. Um, but I think this one really does pull it off really well. And, uh, yeah. He said it's very cinematic. The camera gets in the ring with him. Um, it's not just like a three-quarter over-the-shoulder <laughs> shot the entire time where you can see clearly that Pepsi sponsored this match. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> which you see in a lot of them. You see the big logo yeah. right in the middle. Uh, this one is clearly, it was shot for the film. Uh, it's very cinematic. And then you get some of the stuff outside of the ring as well. Is the luchador action as dynamic as stuff we see today in modern luchador? Probably not. You don't see the flips and the dips and all this other stuff. Or is a uh, is a Jim Cornette that calls it that flippy dippy stuff? <laughs> uh, you know, you don't see a lot of that. But the luchadors back then were not built that way. They were more the barrel chested, you know, Superman just ah types. And I love them. Yeah. Well, like uh, that said, there's one shot in this that I feel like it wasn't Santo. Uh, there's one shot. I feel like somebody else was doubling him not in the ring, but there's like a dialogue shot and it's a profile and he looks so skinny compared to the other. I two. know what you're talking it's about. Like, I, I, I noticed that. Yeah, I, like, I don't know. Cause like, I mean, he, he, he's in a suit and tie most of this movie, especially throughout the, the third act. Um, yeah. And for most of that time, it looks like his shirt is barely containing him. Like, like yeah. he's going to roll his shoulders back and all the buttons are going to pop off and he's going to start striking some poses. Which would be cool. It would. It'd be real cool. But there's a point, yeah. and I think it's in the same same out, like he's got the jacket off and he just kind of looks small. Very. Even the way he's standing, like through the rest of the movie, I feel like all three of them knew how to quote-unquote work the crowd. They never do a full-on straight shot. They're always kind of walking 
or standing three quarters. Yeah. You know, they've got one leg. They're, they're striking basically superhero poses for the entire the whole thing. Movie. And this one shot, he just seems almost meek and didn't have that same power. And I don't know, maybe, maybe there was something going on. Maybe it's just the way it's shot. I, I don't know. It just didn't feel... <laughs> I'm glad you noticed it too. And it no, just no, me. I noticed that too. I didn't consciously, but when you brought it up, I was like, yeah. Um, he wasn't the oldest of the three as well. Is, yeah, true. Um, Santo had been out a lot longer than the other two. Because this is, was shot in 1977, um, released in 1979, which makes me wonder again about that, those uh, wraparounds. I wonder if those were shot later. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, he, yeah, I, I imagine mm -hmm. that he'd be like, I just want to sit down. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I just want to sit down sometimes. Why? <laughs> Why does Mos Mil Moscris always have to have the, I'm sitting down, I have a banana. I want a banana <laughs> break. Yeah. <laughs> Like, no, Santo, it's not part of your character. I'm going to eat a banana. Uh, <laughs> but overall... But if that's my one nitpick about this movie, I think that probably says how much I enjoyed this movie. Overall, I just um, have such a good time with this. I'm always having a blast. All One thing that these Luchador movies make me wish is that Adam West got to do more Batman movies. Oh, oh, oh man, yeah. Because I think I think that's the closest we have in in American, you know, popular culture is Adam West's Batman. I think that's the closest we have to Luchadors. Because it knows exactly what it is. It plays it completely mm -hmm. straight. It winks at you rarely because it's counting on you to be in on the joke as an adult. And if you're a kid watching it, it doesn't want to break that for you. Right. Um, yeah, that makes sense. It's just, these, these occupy the same spot in my head. And if I wish like NECA or McFarlane Toys would put out some like, you know, Legends of Lucha Libre figures. That would be dangerous, dude. Because he, <laughs> oh, I've, I've prayed real hard. Now, I, I still have a lot of stuff. But when I moved from Oregon to Washington, uh, which yeah, I got rid of a lot of things and I realized that I, I have a lot of stuff that kind of weighs me down. And yeah, it might be enjoyable and all, but how much can I enjoy it if I have to keep it in a box most of the time because I don't have room for mm -hmm. it. So I got rid of a lot of stuff and I'm still giving stuff away through like mystery box giveaways on the stream and things like that. But if there were some highly detailed luchador figures... Dude, I mean, like to separate shelf set up in here. I'd redo the whole thing, man. Six, the whole six or seven inch scale, like articulated. Man, can you imagine like the McFarlane toys? Oh, that'd be amazing. <laughs> man, that would be cool. Uh, I just double checked here, and if the Internet Movie Database is to be believed. Santo would appear in four more movies after this, uh, one credited only as a cameo uh, when uh, they tried to make it go at Son of Santo being the lead. So we have Santo versus the TV Killer, which is a great title, <laughs> The Fist of Death, The Fury of the Karate Experts, another great title, and then Chanuk and the Son of San Santo versus the Killer Vampires. So if nothing else, these have all got great titles. Yes. <laughs> all, of, all of his movies have great titles uh like his first one they wasn't all that, do versus the evil brain like yes that's amazing yeah i have yeah i have a bootleg mexican poster for uh el santo in the house of terror that is on the back of a poster for the shark movie tintorera uh Oh, I'm not familiar with that. that. It's 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 bad for a number of reasons. That good, huh? <laughs> uh, seven seventy shark movie problems. Uh, Enough said. Yeah. 
But it's on the back of a poster for that, and it's written in Sharpie, saying that in Spanish, at 8 p.m., we're showing El Santo in the in the House of Death or Hotel of Death. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Um, and I just, I saw that when I was going through some old lobby cards and posters at an antique store. And I was like, oh, there's yeah. writing on the back of this one. <gasps> Yeah. Um, so I I bought it was it was a lot. I had to buy the lot, but for that alone, it was worth it. And there were a lot of cool yeah. lobby cards and stuff in there too. So I wasn't mad. No, no, I wouldn't be at all. Uh, I own one. I take that back. I think I have like four or five, but I have framed one lobby card from a Luchador film. And as much as I love Bill Moskers, I mean he's my dude. The one that I have framed is a Santo one. It's the uh, Santo. And I was looking it up furiously here while we were talking because I'm I'm just going to try to say the English title: Santo versus the Killers from Other Worlds. Oh, okay. Where he basically fights a blob. Yes. Yeah. I and uh, I've talked about it here on the show in the past, uh, and it's it's amazing. And it's it's my lobby card up here next to my Dracula versus Frankenstein from from Mexico, and uh, I think it's an Italian Plague of the Zombies. One sheet or a lobby card. Wonderful. So, yeah. No. I, yeah. That's amazing. I have that poster. Uh, the 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 actual the film poster, not an actual one, but in like a uh, eleven by twenty five or something. It's nice, beautiful. I mean, the artwork in this stuff is pretty cool. I'm hoping to have at least one T shirt posted in the T Public shop. Um, during Lucha de Mayo, just because I love this yeah. stuff, you know, just just our work's amazing, and it's it's just this crazy weird aesthetic that would really resonate if done well up here. If you're saying the Adam West stuff would be great, yeah, that's that's the feel, and there people love that now. Like there was some backlash to it not too long ago, but now it's like, yeah. I cringe whenever I hear somebody talk about that in a negative, like, no, don't you understand? That's awesome. You know, the, the camp is part of the fun, yeah. you know? So, yeah. it's, I, I I like to point out a bunch of old, ridiculous Batman stories from the 40s, like one where he has to uh, pretend to be a quarterback while Robin goes and investigates the actual quarterback's whereabouts. And it's like the championship game and Batman scores the touchdown to win. And like... You know, Batman got weird there for a little while. For a long time. <laughs> yeah, That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Batman just got weird. And uh, I, I love the old stuff now. I mean, this Adam West stuff is amazing. Um completely not talking about lucha or stuff at all but i follow a youtube channel called the corridor crew oh yeah they are a special effects house out of uh, california and you know they talk about how effects are done and they do little things here and there and they took the trailer for the batman the new film yeah. and put adam west in it and it's amazing wonderful <laughs> it's beautiful it's 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 so fun, and while I haven't seen the Batman, the Robert Pattinson film, I'm not a huge Batman fan, you know, outside of the Adam West stuff. Um, the shots that they got in this trailer where they recreate the Batmobile from 66, jumping through the smoke and fire, it's it's a work of art, it's, man. It's so good. It's gorgeous. And what the heck, I'll, leave, I'll put a link in the show notes for that, too. <laughs> uh, this movie... Is it available for people to get their hands on now? I wonder. Um, is it? There is a recent-ish. Is it? A, there's a recent-ish English subtitled DVD from I want to say like 2012. Okay. Um, it it's out of print, but it's recent enough that it's not super exorbitant. Uh, I think it's like maybe twenty to forty dollars. And it's on a double feature with Champions of Justice. Well, there you go. Um, That's a double feature I want to watch. Uh, I haven't like, gotten it myself because, again, down here, these movies turn up on TV quite a bit. So 
I've always felt bad uh, about the idea of spending money on it because I get to watch them for free so much of the time. Um, yeah. I did pick up that Santo box set, though. Um, and I do not regret it. <laughs> um, a very, very generous listener of the show got that for me. Um, and uh, it's it's amazing. I'm very happy to have it. Uh, anything that I can do to make sure there's more Santo and Luchador action on Blu-ray in the world, man. It's on Blu-ray. Do it. Uh, it's, it's all good. It's wonderful. Yeah, so I'm just doing a quick search on Amazon. I'm not finding a listing for it, but I'm sure there are places you can get your hands on it. Uh, the the Lucha Libre double feature DVD set uh, is the one. That's where I saw Champions of Justice for the first time. Don't know why I never bothered to watch Mystery in Bermuda. Huh. But that is where I watched Champions of Justice for the first time, and I fell in love with that movie. <laughs> um, we Listeners who know, I was just on your show talking about the Mighty Gorga and kind of relaying how um, I tried to show an ex-girlfriend the Mighty <laughs> Gorga, and now she's both an ex. <laughs> <laughs> While that might not necessarily be related, uh, I did try to show my current girlfriend some clips from Champions of Justice, and she had a blast. Good. So it's a good sign. So I got a winner. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, look, they're they're riding motorcycles because they're like the Avengers of Luchadors, and ah, they're fighting middle people. They're fighting minis. That's offensive. No, that's what they're called. They're minis. They're. <laughs> <laughs> um. Courtney and I, uh, back in March, we went on a trip for our, our wedding anniversary down to Corpus, and we picked up this mm-hmm. weird channel on our hotel TV, and they showed this Luchador movie that I had never heard of. I put it on my letterbox uh, because I knew I would never find it again if I didn't document it somehow. Okay. And it is called... Ah. Los Jaguares contra el Invasor Misterioso. The, the Jaguars versus the Mysterious Invaders. Um, okay. And it's a, a team of brother luchadors, three brothers, who wear Jaguar themed trunks and masks. And they're fighting uh, aliens. And what was it called? Um, the Jaguars versus the Mysterious Invaders. You've got my attention. Wow, these are all names that I don't see in a lot of these movies. That's No, it's... Uh, the way I summarized it was uh, three wrestlemen in Jaguar print masks and leotards fight a gorilla man from outer space and his goons. Who include two pe- little people wrestlemen, a bald guy in an orange jumpsuit, and maybe a blonde lady in a paisley romper, and her bored-looking boyfriend slash husband. I couldn't tell whose side they were on. What more could you possibly want? Fair enough. It was a blast. And there, <laughs> I'm in. There man. was a helicopter chase too. Oh well. <laughs> yeah, a helicopter chase and a motorcycle chase through like a like a high grass field. It was. Uh, it sounds amazing is what it sounds. It, it is. It was. <laughs> we had just come back from dinner and I turned on the TV and. <gasps> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I, I don't get to talk about these movies enough. Uh, I it may, maybe by having the Lucha de Mayo thing on monster kid radio, I kind of damn myself for, only talking about these movies so enthusiastically one time a year. Maybe that's all the listeners can handle overall, but I, I don't talk about them enough. So uh, to talk to somebody who, you know, really likes these movies um, the way that you do gives me, you know, just, Oh, I'm, I'm charged up, man. I want to, I want to go, I want to go put on a luchador mask and fight traffic right now. I'm just like, ah, you know, just like, ah, you know, that's okay. No, I, I did the same thing. Um, before we wrap up, there's two things that I want to do. First of all, I want to make sure that, Listeners know where to find you. So, uh, record all monsters. Record all monsters. Where is it? Uh, 
pod.wordpress.com is our website. The landing page takes you to the latest episodes. You can also find us on all the good social medias, which are none of them. But you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> You can find them on the ones I haven't decided to quit using yet. Uh, <laughs> so to search Record All Monsters podcast on Facebook, we pop right up uh, at Monsters Record on Twitter and at Record All Monsters Pod on Instagram. You can also email us, Record All Monsters Pod at gmail.com. If you weren't aware, we hinted at it. Derek was on the show last week talking about. The Mighty Gorga, uh, the greatest gorilla movie of all time. Uh, or at least that year. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, we, we had a great time with that. Uh, I think I'm planning this week to have a, a mini-sode about the Valley of Guanji. Uh, nice. Which is uh, it's slightly outside of our regular wheelhouse, um, but... It's so good. It's so good. When I first saw it, I told my wife, you know, this, you know who would love this movie? Me. <laughs> <laughs> and I do. Nice. And I do. But it's, it's Harry Housen's last dinosaur movie, so I feel like we have to at least, you know, take a, a quick look at it. So. Sure. Right on. Well, the other thing that I want to do, which, um, you know, I've, I've been kind of shifting where I do it in the show because you've been on the show a lot and I think people know you. So it's none of this getting to know you stuff. Now it's just, let's have some fun and let's play around with the classic five. <laughs> the classic five. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The Classic Five, for listeners who don't know, it's a game that we used to play at the beginning of the episodes uh, to introduce our listeners to our guests. And, and maybe I'll still do it at the beginning of so It doesn't matter. We're doing it now. Uh, there's no right or wrong answers. There's a literal deck of cards here which have this or that, which movie do you prefer style questions on them. It's just a way to get monster kids talking about their favorite topic, which is monster movies. And this time around, I'm going to style a few of the questions, skew them a little bit to kind of hang out with the luchador sub genre a little bit here okay are you ready to play a round of the classic five always i'm not even gonna bother looking at the cards because i'm just kind of pulling this uh, out of thin air since we're talking about some luchador stuff what hammer film needs a luchador that's that's hard that's really hard because you know what it's not hard. The Hammer film that needs a luchador is Curse of the Werewolf. Whoa. That's not where I would have gone. Okay. I love that movie, but what you do, how you bring a luchador in. All luchadors, of course, are scientists. So, you have yeah. a, a luchador in the present day makes a time machine, kind of like Treasure of Dracula with Santo. Um and he winds up transporting himself into this story and uh, <laughs> has to fight Oliver Reed. All right. Other than that, it's basically like it. the same um... film. Oh, like I said, it's not exactly where I would have gone with that, <laughs> but that's okay. I dig it. I dig it. All right. Uh, card number two. What Universal Monster movie needs a luchador? All right. <laughs> so this one is uh, is very easy. It's House of Dracula. Really? Yeah. Okay. It's already a comic book. You just, again, all luchadors are scientists. You just swap the mad scientists out. Yeah. And... You've got another combatant. That last fight goes differently. Very differently. <laughs> a lot more chops. Yeah. A lot more just, chops. Uh, it may be an octopus stretcher. Yeah. yeah. Just uh, just 
you know, throwing Glenn Strange uh, up on the back. <laughs> I like it. All right. I like that. All right. So, uh, Curse of the Werewolf and House of Dracula. We've just luchadorized <laughs> two classic monster movies, and I love it. All right. Uh, card number three. Um, what classic monster movie or classic monster movie monster would you like to see the luchadors fight? Because they fought a lot, but they didn't fight all. Yeah. Well, we've seen mummies. We've seen yeah. many Frankensteins. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know if I've seen a Gill Man. Yeah, I mean, there's that... There's kind of like Gill Man, like analog or substitute, but not quite. Um... There is that one where the, uh, John Carradine's the head of a bunch of lady vampires. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, yeah. With, with, That's uh, a good one. The demon, but two who they haven't fought. Um, this is this is a hard one, Derek. Um. Okay. Luchadors versus the Phantom of the Opera. Ooh. Oh, man. Okay. I want, oh, okay. I, I Yeah, of course I want to see that. And of course I don't want it to be an opera house. I want it to be an arena. And <laughs> yeah. oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. And it, I'm in. It's, it's, uh, it's so obvious. I feel terrible that it took me so long to think about it. I like it. See, my brain went to like an Invisible Man kind of thing, but how fun would it be to watch them fight an Invisible Man? I mean, he, yeah, I don't know. I, but yeah, man, a Phantom of the Opera would be dope. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. I'll accept it. Um, <laughs> no wrong answers. No wrong answers. Uh, let's see. Card number four. Of course, I'm going to try to stick it, you know, keep in keep the it. luchador. Um, yeah, yeah. What classic monster movie monster would make a great luchador? Well, we, we know the answer by the many appearances of the Frankenstein monster throughout all of these luchador movies. Oh, of course. God, his few Manchu mustache. I love that mustache. <sighs> of course. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, I don't know uh, if you you read any Hellboy. Mm. But one of the the parts of the Hellboy in uh, in Mexico storyline, I can't remember the name of it, but it's basically House of Frankenstein, but they want Hellboy to wrestle a a Frankenstein. Huh? In an arena, and there's like a Lon Chaney analog, and it's great, and I love it, and. Let's let's make yeah, and also we have to do it in the the tradition of trying not to get sued by Universal, and call him Frankenstein. Spell with a Q. Yeah, and no no <laughs> N no N. Frankenstein. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> oh man, I love that. All right, I don't have really a luchador flavored fifth. Um, a kind of drama. Uh, let's see. Um, I mean, I, I could ask who your favorite luchador is, but you've already made it clear. Oh, yeah. You're a Santo I guy. I am a Santo guy. I think I sent you You're a, a picture guy. of that portrait that I had breakfast under. Yeah, that's right. God, you're right. That's right. I remember that now. Mm -hmm. so amazing good. all right um i don't know uh i'll just draw a random card here because i you know what what was your door would you have go up against a kaiju film a kaiju monster okay again i think this is just a matter of taste and i'm gonna go santo because you know he's he's the man for all seasons he uh I, <laughs> oh, he's a man for all. I love that. I I think 
the idea would be the Santo realizes that he himself can't wrestle, you know, a hundred and fifty tall radioactive monster. Sure. So he's gonna work on a way to communicate with them. Okay. And uh, he's gonna find out that the monster, whoever it is, is acting the way they are right now because they can sense an alien invasion is coming. So then Sanko okay. and the Kaiju will work together. The, of course the, they got a team the up. Kaiju, yeah. The Kaiju, it, let's say it's Godzilla. Let's just go out and say it's Godzilla. My two favorites here. Um, got, so Godzilla's fighting the alien monster and Santo's fighting uh, the alien leader and it's like a mirror battle and... He's figured out how to communicate with Godzilla telepathically. And I want that to be real. I want it to be <laughs> real so bad right now. <laughs> uh, I, I would love to see it somehow. I don't know how you do it. A, a kaiju luchador mashup somehow. I don't know how, but I do like the idea that, yeah, of course they're all scientists, so yeah, that's what we're yeah. going to do. I, I think maybe... I do like that. What if we had a, a Luchador season, themed season of Ultraman? Ultraman Lucha would be amazing. I think there was a Ultraman Luchador in Japan for a little while, because Lucha Libre is very popular over there. Milo Ventura Chavez under the Ringman Ultra name. Huh. And I'll I'll send you and he he did it all. It looks like I'll send you I'll I'll send you a link to this. Okay, because it's it, it's apparently real. Uh, well, I'm in then. I'm all in. He was one third of a wrestling trio known as the Space Cadets. Yeah. Yes, and he had his own comic book series. Oh. Somewhere out there, there's a Mexican comic book featuring a Luchador Ultraman. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Yeah, that's cool. And he's got a son who wrestles as well as Ultraman Jr. Yeah. Okay, I, I got to see this. I got to tell me there's something out there. I'm going to, oh, you gave me a rabbit hole to get into, my friend. Enjoy. <laughs> oh, man. Well, thank you for this amazing gift, and thank you for being on Monster Kid Radio this week I... and kicking off this year's Luchador uh, Extravaganza. It is the greatest honor Luchador. of my life, and that is only a slight exaggeration. <laughs> I, I hope it's just. I hope it's an exaggeration. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, go check out Robert at Record All Monsters. Link in the show notes, as always. Um, yeah, stay tuned. I think Robert and I might do some other stuff down the line at some point. Let's just say that. Leave it at that. <laughs> well, like Robert alluded to and mentioned repeatedly, I did appear on the most recent episode of Record All Monsters, where he and I talked about the movie The Mighty Gorga, which, you know, if you've ever wanted to listen to a podcast where a couple of podcasters just basically laugh their way through an episode, that's the episode you want to listen to because we just had so much fun talking about this movie that, as he put in the show notes of his episode about that, oh boy, we discuss a movie that's definitely a movie. So go check that out. <laughs> oh man, Robert, thank you for being part of the show. I really appreciate it. Okay, uh, let's see. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I need to thank. Thank you, dear listener, for being part of the Monster Kid Radio audience experience, the Radiohead Collective, whatever y'all want to call yourselves. As long as y'all call yourselves Monster Kids, you're good by me. Thank you. Now go check out monsterkidradio.net to follow up on anything that you've heard about here on this episode of the podcast. Links to what Robert's up to, to what Mark's up to. Our Amazon affiliate links are there as well, as well as our T Public store and yes... There are now two luchador flavored t-shirts available at the Monster Kid Radio T Public Shop. So go check that out as well. Get your hands on some merch supporting Monster Kid Radio along the way, being able to support some luchador hotness on a shirt. I mean, come on. I mean, this is just awesome. 
Also on the website, you're going to find links to everything we've got going on. Monster Kid Radio's Facebook page and group, our Twitter, our Discord, our Reddit, our Patreon, everything. You'll even find a link to our Twitch, which we run every weekend. We show monster movies all day on Saturday and part of the day on Tuesday. And this Saturday, it's the Mimiverse Mimathon. Christopher R. Mim is an independent filmmaker who, for a long time, used to tell people he made good, bad movies. I struggled with that for a long time, and I'm not saying it was because I voiced my concern about it that he stopped saying it, as I really hope he's just kind of embraced the fact that, darn it, he makes good movies. Christopher R. Mim has been making a movie a year for over 10 years, longer than that now. I'd have to double-check the calendar, but it's been a while, and every one of these movies is done in the style of the classic B-movies that he grew up watching with his dad. And that's awesome. With titles like Monster and Phantom Link, Wersquito Nazi Hunter, Attack of the Moon Zombies, The Giant Spider, and so on, these movies are just awesome and made for people like you and me. And he's given us permission to show his movies this weekend. I'm not going to be able to show them all because there's too many to show in that small time period that we have, which is pretty much the entire day. That's how much stuff he's put out there. But we're going to show a lot of his stuff on Saturday more of the monster movie flavored stuff. And then on Tuesday for the Monster Kid Astronomy Club, we'll show some more of his more sci-fi influenced type stuff. So that'll be coming in the stream. Stay tuned for that. Next week here on the show, Kenny is back for a full on episode talking about a blue demon movie versus the Diabolicas, I believe is what he said it was. Again, I cannot roll my R's. Not sure what that's about. I should really get to work on that. Is there a surgery I can get? Can I have something done to modify the way my tongue works to... Never mind. Just look in the show notes. So for monsterkidradio.net, and it'll tell you the name of the movie that's coming up next week. I'm not sure what the third and final week of Lucha de Mayo 2022 is going to bring to us movie-wise, although I have some things in mind, so stay tuned for that. So hey, until next week. Monster Kid Radio is a registered service mark of Monster Kid Radio, LLC. All original content of Monster Kid Radio by Monster Kid Radio, LLC is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. Of course, that doesn't apply to the song From the Deep. That comes from the band The Delstroyers. It's copyright 2022, The Delstroyers. comes from their brand new album, 10,000 Ways to Die, which you can pick up digitally right now. Name your own price. I recommend at least $8. That's what Bandcamp was kind of pitching, but if you can do a little bit more, awesome. Anything you can do to help out the bands that support us and make us awesome, well, I appreciate you for doing that. So go check them out. And like I said, they've got a record release show coming up on May 28th at the Kraken Bar and Lounge in Seattle. They've also got some tour dates that they've posted on their website. They're doing a show at Shanty's Tavern on June 10th. That's also in Seattle. In Shoreline, Washington, on June 24th, they're going to be at Daryl Savern. And on July 16th, in Bellingham, Washington, they're going to be at the Blue Room. Again, the delstroyers.bandcamp.com is where you're going to find all this information. They're also on Facebook, so look them up that way. I love them. I love what they do. Go check them out. Until next week, my name is Derek M. Cook, and I'll talk to you then. Adios. Adios. <laughs>